I want to welcome you all to the 2016 Jesrev Distinguished Lecture on Water and tell you a little bit about how this lecture series got started. Um, I'm Michelle Bryan. I teach water law here at the law school. And I'm very proud that we have this lecture series. It's really unique in the nation as far as distinguished lectures at law school for its focus on water law. And the gentleman that created the, the, um, and endowed this lecture series and, and also provided other support to our public land resources law review, um, his name was Frank Jestrab. And he's a 1938 graduate. He is now um, deceased. But be, um, in his latter years of life, he brought this endowment to the law school and specifically asked um, that part of its focus be on water. He did a lot of interesting things in his career. Um, he was born on the High Line in Haver, um, close to where I grew up, but much earlier in time, in 1913. He um, graduated from law school and worked for the Anaconda Copper Mining Company in Butte until 1942. He uh, served in the armed services, achieving the rank of captain, and he traveled to various places internationally in this work. And that informed part of his guidance to us on what this lecture series should be about. He then practiced law in New York, <coughs> Texas, Wyoming, and North Dakota, predominantly in the field of oil and gas. And um, he married Elvira, his wife in 1952, and they together, with both of their names, are on this particular endowment. In light of all of his work and his experiences in the armed services, he had, uh, Frank had a strong belief that water was, most, was one of the most important things for communities to have conversations about. So even though he himself didn't practice water law, directly, he felt that it was significant enough to single out for our community to have a conversation. He, although elderly when the, this series began, he watched the recordings of this talk faithfully and commented on whether we were on target enough with the topics of our talk, urging us to go beyond Montana to other places in the West and around the world so that things happening in other places related to water could become part of our conversation here. So some of our past talks have been on the human right to water, the evolution of the public trust doctrine, and the use of watersheds as an alternative tool for water governance. So I'm really excited to hear today's talk, um, which is made possible um, because of the efforts of Professor Martha Williams, who will be introducing our speaker. Thank you, Michelle. So I first want to recognize a third year law student, Halle Berry. And she is the conference editor for the Public Land and Resources Law Review. And she did all of the um, background work to make sure Anne had a good visit and to make sure that today's lecture runs smoothly. So thank you, Howie. Yay! <laughs> so next, um, it's, it's really my honor and pleasure to get to introduce Anne Castle. Last night, she was talking about how interconnected and interdisciplinary water is. That in a way, instead of talking about us fighting over it, it has pulled us together in so many ways. 
And she's the perfect person, I think, to deliver this lecture today because she exemplifies unifying people around a really important issue. She also has a breadth of experience in water policy and water law. So what does she do now? She is currently, and you get to correct me on the back of this, <laughs> hope to embarrass you. She's currently a senior fellow at the Getchus Wilkinson Center on, it's a, it's a long one, Center on, the, on Natural Resources, Energy, and the Environment, which is part of the University of Colorado School of Law in Boulder. And there you're currently working on water issues of water scarcity and then also the Colorado Water Plan. I understood it. But before being at the Getchus Wilkinson Center and served as the Assistant Secretary for Land and Water at the US Department of the Interior. So what does that mean? That means that she oversaw the Bureau of Reclamation. The Bureau of Reclamation is the largest water wholesaler in the country. And then she also oversaw the USGS, US Geological Survey. And the G USGS, it's really it's an unusual entity because it is the only agency solely dedicated to science. And in addition to that, it holds these incredible records on um, land statistics, uh, what vast earth and biological data holdings. So a breadth of experience there. And um, while she served as the Assistant Secretary, she spearheaded Department of the Interior's Water Smart program. And you were the driving force, as I understand it, I think you're too modest to say it, behind an MOU among the Department of the Interior, the Department of Energy, and the Army Corps of Engineers addressing sustainable hydropower um, generation. But what endeared Anne to me forever, and why she, I think she's the perfect person to deliver the lecture in today's times, is that she represents commitment to the resources, hard, hard work, and unfailing professionalism. And I think we can all learn from that. So um, while I was at the Department of the Interior in the solicitor's office, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Park Service asked me to kind of look over the work of the Glen Canyon Dam Adaptive Management Working Group. And they warned me that following the work of this adaptive management team, working group, was like following a soap opera that you could not make up for yourself, that the facts were unbelievable. So would it, so and, chaired the Glen Canyon Adaptive Management Working Group. And what does that mean? The AMWIG, as it was called, oversaw the criteria on the operations of Glen Canyon Dam. No, no big deal, really. <laughs> we'll add to that, who are the members of AMWIG? There are four federal agencies that always agree, <laughs> right? Six tribal nations, two environmental groups, two representatives of recreational interests, seven basin states, two federal power purchasers, contractors, <coughs> and then always two designated stakeholders. So add to that a herd of cats, that they were also always in active litigation against one another. <laughs> so no small feat, but what endeared me to Anne's professionalism was she ran those meetings impeccably. I, and I, I, to this day, I don't know how you did it. So with that, I'd like to welcome Anne Cassidy. Well, thank you, Martha. And um, thanks to all of you for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure. Um, I got to talk with Professor Bryan's water law class yesterday, which was really fun, and had a very warm welcome and dinner um, with Dean Curgis last night and all of the students on the Public Land Law Review. So um, I feel like I've gotten to know your law school and your campus a little bit in the short time that I've been here. So I'm going to talk about the law of the Colorado River today. And although it fits with the description of let's look outside Montana, um, 
I think I should explain a little bit um, about why you might be interested in the Colorado River. First of all, it's a river that's known for its superlatives. It is the most volatile in terms of supplies. It has the most iconic landscapes. It's the most dammed. It's the most litigated. And in recent years, it's been designated as the most threatened. Um, the overall imbalance between supply and demand in the Colorado River system is not improving. It's getting worse. Um, that's because of increased population growth in the areas that it serves, but it's also because the supplies are dramatically affected by climate change. If you look at climate change maps or global circulation models, the southwestern United States, basically the Colorado River Basin, is ground zero for uh, climate change impacts or temperature impacts on water. Um, and that's what the managers in the Colorado River Basin have to deal with. The reason that's relevant here, I think, is because we can all look at the lessons that have been learned in the Colorado River Basin and how scarcity has brought people together to devise innovative solutions and work with each other. Uh, and, and everybody takes a hit for the team um, but work toward creating a more sustainable system. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll try to call your attention to parallels as we go along. So first, um, like any good water lawyer, you start with a map. Um, this is the Colorado River Basin, and I'll point out a few things. Can everybody hear me in the back loud enough? Okay. Um, so seven basin states, um, starting up in the headwaters in Colorado and Wyoming, all the way down to the Gulf of California. This map is actually um, a little bit uh, innovative because for a very long time, the only Colorado River Basin maps that you could find stopped at this border right here and didn't show any of the, either the river or the basin um, in Mexico. Um, but this one does, great improvement. Um, a couple of things to point out. First, Lake Powell, um, which is, backs up a couple hundred miles. It's created by Glen Canyon Dam. That was the, um, the dam that Martha referred to in connection with this adaptive management working group. Um, and then we have Lake Mead down here, also a huge reservoir created by Hoover Dam, built in the 1930s. These two reservoirs are the biggest reservoirs in the United States. Um, Lake Mead is the largest, um, and Lake Powell is close behind. And between the two of them, they kind of, they're the plumbing, the operational uh, management for the overall Colorado River system. This is another map of the basin, but this one shows, in addition to the basin itself, the geographical basin, it shows the areas outside the basin that are served by Colorado River water. And there are a lot of them. Um, starting with Cheyenne up here, which gets water from the Little Snake River. This whole area in Colorado that is served by Bureau of Reclamation Irrigation Projects that bring water from the west slope of the Rocky Mountains through tunnels to the east slope and deliver it to reservoirs and then it's um, delivered down to farmers and municipalities. This whole area of the Rio Grande Basin, including Santa Fe and Albuquerque, gets water from the San Juan River up in Colorado, and it's then exported and delivered down here. Salt Lake City, um, also in the surrounding areas, get water from the Colorado River Basin, um, again, through diversions and tunnels that come out of this part of the basin. And then in California, we have the whole Imperial Valley, the Imperial and Coachella Valleys down here that, that get really almost 100% of their supplies from the Colorado River. They're the biggest users on the river. And then this whole area of the Southern California coastal plain, including Los Angeles and San Diego, are highly reliant on Colorado River water. So the basic math around the Colorado River Compact comes from the 1922 Compact. 
Um, that was an agreement among those seven basin states and the Department of the Interior. And it, um, in essence, divided the river 50-50. So lower basin states of Arizona, California, and Nevada get 7.5 million acre feet. And the upper basin states, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico, they also get 7.5 million acre feet. But because hydrology is volatile, somebody had to bear the risk of shortage, and that went to the upper basin. So there's only 10 million acre feet in the river in any given year, then the upper basin only gets two and a half. Um, so that, that becomes a very important issue in the development of the upper basin states. The way it's stated is, um, gives a little more wiggle room than just an annual allocation because the compact actually says that the upper basin won't cause the flow of the river to be depleted below 75 million acre feet over any 10 year period. So you can deal with changing hydrology as long as your 10 year moving average comes out to 75 million acre feet. But what's interesting about the compact and remembering that this was all done in 1922, was it's pretty well agreed that the drafters got the numbers wrong because they were looking at a relatively short period of record. We didn't have great records on the flows in the Colorado River. They only went back to about 1890 um, and through 1920 at the time the compact was being negotiated. And that period included some um, very wet hydrological years. Um, and so they were looking at a baseline that wasn't representative. It was wetter than average. And so they, they thought there was more water to be divided up than there actually has turned out to be. And that's even more true today. So in 1922, there, um, there was no agreement with Mexico about how much water from the Colorado River, Mexico, we get. But the compact drafters provided for the possibility that, that that kind of agreement would be reached in the future. And they said, if Mexican deliveries are agreed to, the burden will be split equally between the upper basin and the lower basin, which makes sense based on that equal, sort of equal allocation in the first place. So um, the Colorado River Compact in 1922 was followed quickly by a federal enactment, the Boulder Canyon Project Act, which apportioned the lower basin's allocation of 7.5 million acre feet among the three lower basin states. And so California gets the lion's share, 4.4 million, Arizona, 2.8. Nevada only has a small portion of the state that is served by the Colorado River, um, and so it gets 300,000 acre feet. The, um, the statute provided that it only became effective after the 1922 compact was ratified by all seven states, and at this point, it had only been ratified by six. Arizona was the holdout, and, and that is a theme that is repeated throughout the history of the Colorado River. Um, but Arizona finally ratified the compact in 1944, so these allocations went into effect. Um, there were certain aspects of the Boulder Canyon Project Act and the way it was interpreted that were challenged in um, original jurisdiction litigation in the U.S. Supreme Court, Arizona sued California. But there was a decree in that case in 1963 that, um, that both resolved the specific controversies and uh, ratified the provisions of the Boulder Canyon Project Act. So then we um, fast forward to 1944, um, when we did reach a treaty with Mexico. And um, one of the interesting things about this treaty is that it not only addresses the Colorado and the Tijuana rivers, but it also addresses the Rio Grande. And it, it turns out that the United States wasn't all that interested in reaching agreement with Mexico on the Colorado River, um, but we were very interested in reaching agreement on the Rio Grande because Mexico had storage reservoirs that we wanted deliveries from. So we, as the US, were interested in 
um, binding Mexico to deliver us water on the Rio Grande, and Mexico in turn insisted that the deal include the Colorado where it got uh, guaranteed deliveries from the United States. And the treaty provided that the US would deliver to Mexico 1.5 million acre feet every year, not a 10 year moving average, but every year um, in Colorado River supplies. Which is quite a lot if you think back to that original map um, based on the amount of uh, Mexico that's geographically within the Colorado River Basin. Um, they were getting a, a relatively good deal um, out of this agreement. But there was a provision in the agreement um, that dealt with the volatility of the river. And I've highlighted it here. It deals with what happens in the case of extraordinary drought. And this is what that highlighted provision says. In the event of extraordinary drought, making it difficult for the US to deliver the guaranteed quantity of 1.5 million acre feet, the water allotted to Mexico will be reduced in the same proportion as consumptive uses in the US are reduced. Um, makes sense, right? Everybody's bearing a portion of the risk of shortage. Um, but the problem was that uh, nothing in the treaty defined extraordinary drought, um, so we don't know what that means. Um, and it also isn't obvious what this means, reduced in the same proportion as uses in the US. Um, so both of those provisions were problematic. They have never been invoked, but it created some uncertainty about what happens when things go bad in the Colorado River system. So that, um, those questions uh, are out there as of 1944 and continuing on. So now I'm going to cover about six years of development in 30 seconds. Um, first, in 1948, there was um, a federal statute enacted similar to that Boulder Canyon Project Act that allocated in the lower basin. This one allocates supplies in the upper basin states, but because the upper basin um, entitlement floats with the hydrology, we don't know exactly what they're getting in any given year, um, the allocations to each of the states were percentages, not um, absolute volumes of water. Colorado has the lion's share. Um, it has a big percentage of the basin, but it was clearly the most developed at the time this statute was enacted, and that was part of the, um, one of the factors that was taken into account. Um, and then quickly, 56, we have the Colorado River Storage Project Act that gave federal authorization for a bunch of reservoirs to be built in the upper basin, including Lake Powell. Um, 64, Arizona versus California, I've mentioned that already. In 1970, the Bureau of Reclamation came up with long-range operating criteria that basically tell us how Lake Powell and Lake Mead are going to be operated together. And then in 2003, the Quantification Settlement Agreement, which is an agreement among various uh, water user entities in California, um, that resulted from the fact that because there was surplus water in the system, California was using more than its allocated share of 4.4 million acre feet. They weren't doing anything wrong. There was surplus water. But all of the six other basin states were concerned that if California built houses based on 5.3 million acre feet, that that water would never come back. And so the quantification settlement agreement was a deal that gave California a glide path to get back within its agreed upon allocation of 4.4 million. So then we fast forward to the present day. And um, this shows uh, basically <coughs> what's flowing into Lake Powell um, without regulation. So it sort of subtracts out um, all the diversions and reservoir releases um, from 1964, basically, to the present. And the problem that we've been having is the last 16 years. So since the year 2000, flows have been historically low uh, in the Colorado River. And you can see, if you look at the bars above the average line um, previously, and then you compare that to the last 16 years, 
There have been only three years in that entire 16-year period that were above average. Um, the, the average of these years is far below the average of the past uh, 40 years. Um, and these color bars at the end represent what was projected for 2016, the water year that ended last <coughs> month. This projection was done in, um, in September, so that's why this is a little bit uncertain. But it came out almost exactly where it shows. And then these are projections for water year 2017, which um, shows the, the red bar is the most um, probable uh, projection. And it shows basically at the same level as this past year, um, which now in the Colorado River Basin feels really good to us. Um, even though it's not even at the average, that still, based on this hydrology, feels like a great year. Um, so that's the hydrology. We've also got a problem in the lower basin with overuse, continuing after the quantification settlement agreement. Um, and this is a very basic water balance for Lake Mead. Um, and it's all based on annual averages. So on average, Lake Mead gets about 9.0 million acre feet flowing into it. That's releases from Lake Powell that are owed by the upper basin to the lower basin. Um, uh, part of the obligation to Mexico that the upper basin delivers through Lake Powell into Lake Mead. Um, and then there's some tributary inflows between Lake Powell and Lake Mead. That, all of those figure into the 9.0 million acre feet. The outflows are 9.6 million acre feet. And that's deliveries to the three lower basin states, 1.5 million to Mexico, system losses along the way, so deliveries that were released from Lake Mead that don't get picked up and don't get counted um, by the water users in Southern California or, um, Western Arizona. Um, so 9.6 million in outflow, and then there's another 600,000 acre feet of evaporation from the surface of Lake Mead. So inflows, 9.6, outflows, 10.2. We've got a 1.2 million acre feet imbalance every year. That translates to about 12 feet of elevation in Lake Mead. So on average, every year, Lake Mead loses 12 feet. And you can see that if you look at the graphed elevations of Lake Mead over time. So this graph starts in 2000, um, and Lake Mead is going down pretty relentlessly um, from year to year. You don't have to be a water engineer um, to see that we have a, a trend here. Um, the aberration was in 2011. There were really big flows in the upper basin, and those long-range operating criteria require more releases to the lower basin if Lake Powell is filling up a lot. So that happened once, um, but then since then, the trend continues. Um, so we've got a significant problem in the lower basin with overuse. And that's what they call the structural deficit. Um, and that is the subject of a lot of discussions right now about how to deal with that structural deficit. Um, I should go back just here on this annual water budget because um, I should say also, nobody's wrong here. Nobody's doing anything illegal. Everybody's taking what they're entitled to. The, the operational program didn't account um, for evaporation. It didn't account for system losses. Um, and those used to be covered by surplus, but they're just not covered by surplus anymore because of the hydrology. So you might look at this as roughly analogous to the dispute on the Yellowstone River between Montana and Wyoming, where Wyoming in, changed their irrigation systems to be more efficient, which used more water, which left farmers in Montana with less water coming across the border. 
it wasn't wrong for the Wyoming farmers to do that, or at least nothing said, nothing in the compact said that they could not do that. Um, but they weren't able to resolve this dispute among themselves, and that resulted in other original litigation in the Colorado Supreme Court, and or sorry, in the U.S. Supreme Court. And um, the point there is that you get an answer. Somebody wins, somebody loses, but it may not answer, and it usually doesn't answer all of the questions. You still have a whole bunch of stuff to resolve, and. If there are ways that the parties can work it out, uh, you can usually come to a deal that is more satisfactory all the way around. So, um, what do we do about this problem with hydrology and overuse in the lower basin? Well, the first thing we do as a federal agency is we study it. Um, and that's what happened in this Colorado River Basin study that was done between 20, 2009 and 2012. Um, the Bureau of Reclamation did this in conjunction with the seven Colorado River Basin states, and they looked at supply and demand projected out over 50 years. And the bottom line conclusion was that there was likely to be a 3.2 million acre feet imbalance between supply and demand at the year 2050, um, or 2060. So um, kind of a big problem. Uh, this was probably the most reprinted page of the Colorado River Basin Study. It's been reprinted all over the place. Um, and it basically just shows supplies over time in blue, demand ramping up over time in red, and then projections for the future and the fuzziness indicates the uncertainty of the projections, but you can tell that it's not going in the, the right direction, which I think everybody knew, um, but it is helpful a lot of times to have an independent, unbiased scientific study that you can quote and, and make use of to try to figure out what your next steps are. So that's what I want to talk about, what's being done. Um, and I, I'm going to sort of address things chronologically, um, but a lot of this stuff is happening at the same time. So initially, we had what are called the 2007 interim guidelines. All seven states are doing what they call drought contingency planning, and minute 319 with Mexico, which I'm going to talk a lot about. So first, the 2007 guidelines. Um, this was an agreement, again, reached between or among the seven basin states and the Department of the Interior. It provides for sharing of both surplus and shortage. And the way it does that is it designates particular levels or elevations in Lake Mead. And it says that if elevations get to those low points, then the three lower basin states will take reduced delivery. So it's trying to, to deal with the fact that there is this sort of relentless um, reduction in elevation in Lake Mead and provide a stopping point. It also provides for equalization of lake levels. That was done um, a little bit before, but uh, the 2007 guidelines are much more explicit about when it happens. And we saw in that Lake Mead elevation chart when it happened in 2011. And, what was done there was um, carrying out the provisions of the 2007 guidelines. And then it also provides for banking of surplus water, um, which is an interesting innovation because um, like a lot of Western water law, the idea with the Colorado River Compact was let's put it to use. And if you're not using it, we want it to go to somebody else who will use it. Um, because the whole point was development of the West and economic productivity. But what that does is it disincentivizes conservation um, very, very strongly. And so one of the innovations in the 2007 guidelines was it created a means for the lower basin states to conserve water and then to be able to store that conserved water in Lake Mead and use it if the hydrology got really bad. Um, so that was. That was a significant achievement. This is the shortage sharing schedule 
for Lake Mead. And um, you can see that it designates certain elevations in Lake Mead. So these are elevations above sea level. The first one starts at 1075. And just for context, Lake Mead has been hovering around elevation 1075 for about the past six months. Um, and then uh, these are the three lower basin states with their, um, their uh, allocations or entitlements. And then in the chart, it shows the reductions um, that they will receive if Lake Mead reaches these elevations. So a um, notable point is <laughs> this column. Um, California doesn't participate in shortage sharing. And that goes back to the fact that in 1968, Arizona was trying to get federal congressional approval for its project called the Central Arizona Project. And that was the project that they were going to use to take advantage of their substantial allocation in the Colorado River compact, 2.8 million acre feet. They really didn't have the means to do that. And so the Central Arizona Project was a series of pipelines and pumps um, that were going to take water from the main stem of the Colorado River and get that water to Central Arizona. Um, but California uh, was looking at the hydrology that had developed between 1922 and 1968 and, and recognizing that if Arizona did ramp up to using its full allocation, that that was going to throw the whole system into stress and that surplus water was not going to be there anymore. So long story short, because California has more members of Congress than all of the other six basin states put together. Um, they said they wouldn't sign on to the federal authorization for the uh, Central Arizona Project unless Arizona agreed to be junior. And so Arizona did. So Arizona's allocation in the Colorado River Compact that comes through the Central Arizona Project is, by agreement, junior to California's 4.4 million acre feet. So when the 2007 guidelines were being addressed, and you know the discussion was, well, I'll take this much shortage. How much are you going to take, California? They said zero, um, because we had a deal. We're senior, you're junior. You take the cut first. So that's what's going on here. Um, so that was 2007. Um, things have not gotten better in the Colorado River Basin. And in fact, the hydrology has gotten worse um, since 2007. Uh, so there continues to be this drought contingency planning effort. And that has gone on pretty much independently in the upper and lower basins. Um, they come together every once in a while, but, but basically the deals are being struck independently. Um, some of the the work that has been done on drought contingency planning has been completed, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But it, it continues to go on as we speak. There are discussions, particularly within the lower basin, about how to address that structural deficit, how to deal with continuing shortage. The federal government has been involved, the Bureau of Reclamation and the Department of the Interior have been involved. They have not been leading these discussions, but they've been facilitating them. Um, and then some of these discussions include the major municipal suppliers in the lower basin, because even though the states hold the water rights, the, the municipal suppliers like Metropolitan Water District of Southern California or Southern Nevada Water Authority, they're the guys who feel the shortage. Um, and so involving them has been critical to success in some of these discussions. Um, partly because they have a customer base that they can charge rates to and pay for some of the measures that are required to address shortage. Um, so in the upper basin, proceeding independently, they have this three-pronged approach to addressing shortage and scarcity. The first is weather modification, which is a, um, a pretentious name for cloud seeding. Um, and there's lots of controversy about whether that works or not that we don't need to talk about. Um, then drought operations of the upper basin reservoirs. Um, what that means is they're thinking about 
Um, if Lake Powell gets to critical elevations where it's about to um, lose its ability to produce hydropower, then they'll release water from some of the higher upper basin reservoirs just to prop up lake levels in Lake Powell. Um, that's kind of a one-time fix, uh, but it is, it has been modeled um, to show that if you have the flexibility to up operate all these upper basin reservoirs together, you can do better things um, for Lake Powell and you avoid um, some of the more dramatic risks that uh, could take place there. And then the real key is demand reduction or demand management, um, as they prefer to call it. But basically, you're trying to get upper basin water users to use less water so that more water flows into Lake Powell so that there's more water in the system altogether. And that's tricky. Um, it also requires a lot of money um, to pay people to power, especially if you're doing it in advance of kind of a crash in the system um, because you're, you're doing it for insurance or risk mitigation um, and, and people uh, tend to want to get paid um, if you're using them for insurance. Um, in the lower basin, there was a memorandum of understanding that was reached among the lower basin states in 2014 that provides for reductions um, in deliveries. It includes those major water suppliers that I referred to. This is Metropolitan that serves Los Angeles and part of San Diego, Central uh, Nevada Water Authority that serves Las Vegas, Central Arizona Water Conservancy District. They're the operators of the Central Arizona Project and the Bureau of Reclamation. So they made these commitments to reduce their take on the system by these amounts over a three-year period. Um, their best efforts commitments, so they can't be sued um, if it doesn't happen, but uh, they appear to be on track, and Arizona has already met its um, commitment for reductions. Then there's this interesting agreement, the System Conservation Agreement, which um, was put together by those same major municipal suppliers. So Met, Southern Nevada, Central Arizona, and also Denver Water, which gets a lot of its supply from the Colorado River Basin. So they put up $11 million um, together with the Bureau of Reclamation to basically pay people to follow um, and to put that water, um, not credited to the people who supply the money, but just to make it go to the system, to try to bring the system into balance. So it's $11 million um, initially, and then the um, 2016 fiscal year appropriations bill added $5 million to it. So um, not huge amounts of money in the overall scheme of things, but enough to demonstrate the capabilities of voluntary conservation, and that was the idea. Then there's minute 319. Um, which I want to talk a lot about because it's a very cool thing. So why is it called a minute? Um, well, it's basically um, an amendment to that 1944 treaty between the United States and Mexico. But treaties have to be approved by Congress. And therefore, amendments need to be approved by Congress. But if all you're doing is kind of fleshing out the details of what was in the original treaty and not really amending it, just kind of agreeing on how things are going to operate, and you do that all at a meeting and somebody takes minutes, then you don't need congressional approval. And that's kind of a time-honored tradition, um, at least in this treaty, of how they operate and address uh, controversies and issues that have come up that, that haven't been addressed before. So um, in this treaty, there are obviously 118 um, minutes uh, previous to this one. So it's a, it's a system that seems to work. So Minute 319 was um, signed in November of 2012. These are the commissioners from the International Boundary and Water Commission. Um, there's both a U.S. and a Mexican section. This is Commissioner Roberto Salon, who is the Mexican commissioner. This is Edward Drusina, the U.S. commissioner. Um, Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar. Um, it was a pretty historic event. Um, it was only a five-year deal. It expires at the end of next year, and it addresses that extraordinary drought 
um, issue that was hanging over us since 1944. But it also does a lot more than that. So the participants are unusual. Um, it, basically, treaties are usually negotiated between the State Department and the Foreign Ministry of the other government. Um, so you've got two federal agencies who, who agree um, and resolve differences and, and come to a meeting of the minds. And that happened here. The uh, Mexican federal agencies, the US federal agencies were involved. But in this case, the discussions around Minute 319 also included the seven Colorado River Basin states, those key water districts um, that had been involved in the system conservation agreement, and for maybe the first time ever, environmental NGOs on both sides of the border. And each of those participants was critical to the success of Minute 319. So it has three components, basically, operational, infrastructure, and environmental. Operational dealt with the sharing of shortage and surplus. And I'll show you a chart that, um, that includes Mexico's agreement on how to take shortage. There were infrastructure investments in which those major municipal suppliers put up money to um, rehabilitate and improve uh, irrigation infrastructure in Mexico. And some of those improvements generated water conservation savings. And those savings could then um, be banked partly by the US funders and partly by Mexico. And it all ended up in like me. And then there was the environmental component. So this is the new shortage sharing schedule. So we have a new column for Mexico. And the environmental component was really groundbreaking. It provided for water that was actually Mexican water stored in Lake Mead to be used to support base flows in the portion of the Colorado River in Mexico, and also to have a pulse flow or a a sort of spring flood to mimic what used to be the natural hydrology of the Colorado River. Um, $10 million uh, was to be raised by those environmental NGOs. Um, so again, these organizations are written into this minute that is basically part of an international treaty. We don't know of any other international agreement that has as named participants environmental NGOs. And then um, the pulse flow, 105,000 acre feet. Um, Mexico is the source of water stored in Lake Mead. Um, and part of that water was generated by that um, infrastructure investment from the municipalities in the US. So I want to tell you about the pulse flow, um, which occurred, it started in March of 2014, continued through the month of May. Um, and to do that, I think it helps to look at a map again. They're very simplified, but this is the part of the Colorado River in Mexico, that little bitty part on the first map that we looked at. Um, Morelos Dam is a Mexican dam. It's the last dam on the Colorado River, the most downstream. Um, so it's right at the border. This is Yuma, Arizona. Um, and then San Luis Rio, Colorado is a town in Sonora, Mexico, about 150,000 people. Obviously, it was named because it was right on the river. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of that. So this was what the Colorado River Delta in Mexico used to look like. There are not very many good pictures of this, but, but we have a description from Aldo Leopold, um, who canoed the Colorado River Delta in 1922, the same year as the compact, and wrote about it in a Sand County Almanac. And one of the things he said, lots of people have favorite quotes from, from this chapter called The Green Lagoons, uh, but this is my favorite. Um, he says, the river was nowhere and everywhere where he could not decide which of a 100 green lagoons offered the most pleasant and least speedy path to the Gulf. So it gives you a visual picture of what this used to look like. And you can tell here that the river is spreading out everywhere. Um, but that's not what it looks like anymore. Uh, this is Morales Dam, and it requires a little explanation. This is the Colorado River coming in from the right, flowing down to the dam. 
It's a diversion dam. It's not a dam that creates a reservoir. So its purpose is to just kind of back up the water and send it through these gates here um, into this big Mexican irrigation canal. And that canal irrigates um, land in the Mexicali Valley, some of the most productive farmland in, um, in our two countries, really. It produces a lot of uh, winter vegetables. It's very profitable, very productive farmland. But what happens to the river? Well, a little bit of it seeps under the dam here, um, but then it basically stops. And there's this little trickle right here. That's the river. Um, and it peters out, you know, within tens of feet uh, below this little pool. So, so the river is no more. Um, below Morales Dam, there is um, very rarely any flow in the river. But that all changed in March of 2014 when they opened the gates. These are the actual gates in Morales Dam, and they let the river through. Um, and this was the pulse flow, 105,000 acre feet that was released over about 30 days. <clears throat> and the idea was to simulate a spring flood um, that would, you know, scour the bottom of the river and, and get rid of all the tamarask and, um, and uh, allow for uh, revegetation by native vegetation and just do all the things that rivers are supposed to do. Well, it didn't work exactly like that. Um, this is what the leading edge looked like, and it was so slow because it was seeping into the, the sandy bottom of the riverbed so much that you could walk along the leading edge of this pulse flow and walk pretty slowly and, and keep up with it. Um, nevertheless, it was doing what we hoped it would do. So this was taken, these are before and after pictures, right at that town of San Luis Rio, Colorado. Um, and this was before the pulse, and this was a week after. So it did become a river again, uh, and um, it had amazing results. Um, I know you can't read this stuff on here, but this was basically tracking the path of the pulse flow. Um, each of these boxes is a, a different day. So it started on March 22nd up here. It goes pretty fast at first, March 23rd, 24th. Blah, 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 blah. It starts slowing down because there's a big groundwater aquifer down here that had to be refilled up. Um, and it's slowly, slowly coming down um, to the Sea of Cortez. And everybody was wondering whether it was going to make it, because we didn't know. We didn't know if that groundwater hole was going to suck it all up. We didn't know if 105,000 acre feet was enough. May 12th, it's almost there. Um, and this is the river coming down from the north. This is the tidal channel of the Sea of Cortez coming up from the south. So that's May 12th. And then on May 15th, they came together. Um, so the river continued to flow down. Spring flood in the uh, uh, tidal uh, flood in the Sea of Cortez, and they met, um, which was the first time in decades that the river had met the sea. So we learned some stuff um, from the pulse flow. Uh, it was slower, it was deeper, it was wider than we thought it was going to be. Um, there was virtually no turbidity, as you might expect in a regular um, spring flood. You could tell from that before and after picture that the, the water looked really clear. Um, and then there's the human element. You know, we expected to see a uh, connection between the surface water and the groundwater, and the scientists were all studying that. We hoped we would see that reconnection of the river to the sea. But what we didn't expect, and what was probably the most moving thing about the pulse flow, was the connection of the communities along the river to a river once again. And <laughs> this was San Luis, which was usually that dry riverbed that you saw in the before picture. So they brought out their lawn chairs, the kids came out, pets in the river, kids in the river, toys of all sorts. Every day, the celebration got bigger. And you know, we've got carnival rides now. And this was all 
pretty much spontaneous, as far as we could tell. The river had just appeared in it. So there were vendors everywhere. We had a brass band. People were dancing on the beach. They were dancing in the river. Um, it, was, it was a profound <coughs> moving event. I was there. I took most of these pictures. And it was uh, something I'll never forget. <coughs> So from the inspirational back to the mundane very quickly, um, we've got all these efforts to solve the basic imbalance problem in the Colorado River system. Um, 1.2 million acre feet of structural deficit. Lots of agreed to shortage sharing, but I'll just cut to the bottom line. It doesn't add up to 1.2 million acre feet. So efforts continue. Um, and the lower basin continues to work on a new shortage sharing schedule. The upper basin continues to work on assessing the risks that there will be a system failure in the upper basin and proactive demand management. And we're working on minute 32x. Um, so you might think it would be 320, but 320 is on something else. So we don't know exactly what the number is going to be, but it'll be 32 something. And there are ongoing discussions with Mexico about that because 319 will expire next year. So this is a proposed new shortage sharing schedule. Um, and just some things to note about this. First of all, it starts at 1090 instead of 1075. So the lower basin is being proactive about trying to get in front of that um, elevation decline by starting shortage sharing at lower levels. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, sort of uh, more graded intervals <coughs> in between California has numbers in its column now. Um, so California may agree to be part of the shortage sharing schedule. And the Bureau of Reclamation is willing to commit to reductions of 100,000 acre feet, partly through addressing system losses and partly through paying for um, fallowing. This is just another version of that that shows the increases that the various states have agreed to. So, you can see here in Arizona's column, their obligation used to be 400,000 acre feet. Now they're agreeing to take a shortage of 640,000. So significant changes in the shortage schedule. Hasn't been agreed to yet. Um, hopefully, <coughs> big push to finish before the end of this administration. Um, and that's partly because of the expiration of minute 319 next year. But uh, partly because of politics, because we're trying to reach an agreement with Mexico, and it deals with the Colorado River, but all of the participants in these discussions are very concerned that issues unrelated to water, issues like immigration, like a beautiful wall, could make us unable to have further discussions with Mexico on this very important issue. And so, the parties are really, really trying to bring something up to the finish line before the end of this year. Um, whether that would happen or not, I don't think we know. Um, so we've got significant achievements on the Colorado River. Uh, we've got this really long list of agencies and entities all involved in discussions about sustainability. Um, there's still closed door discussions with just the seven basin states and the uh, federal agencies um, that other folks are not involved in. That's probably how it's always going to be. But there are broader discussions going on with the tribes, with the environmental agent, uh, NGOs and the water agencies. We haven't had much litigation in the Colorado River Basin over the last 15 years, and we haven't had any state versus state or state versus US litigation. That's a significant achievement. And I think that's because litigation is viewed as failure. Because nobody gets what they want out of a litigated decision. And in the Colorado River Basin, the saying is that failure is not an option. So there's a lot to be done here, but I am optimistic about the progress and the prospects for success. Um, and I think that's because of the history of success in the case, because of the 2007 guidelines, because of Minute 319. I think these entities and the leadership have shown that they are capable 
of coming together and, and reaching very, very difficult decisions. But it takes political courage to make this happen, both among the elected officials and the appointed officials who are in the room. Um, and, and I don't underestimate that at all, but I think that what all of us can do is to support those hard decisions when they get made. Thank you. actually have a system that would able to adapt over time as the U.S.-Mexico treaty allows. Any comments there? I know you Yeah, know absolutely. First of all, um, I want to introduce to all of you John Tubbs, who is your director of the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, in case you don't know him. And John and I were great colleagues at the Department of the Interior. Um, I, I totally agree with you. We've suggested, you know, when, when we were part of the Columbia River Treaty negotiations that they think about the construct of using a minute um, to do what needed to be done. And, and I didn't think there was anything prohibiting that. Do you? Uh, no, I think we had an assistant secretary that was very favorable to that State Department at the time. He then left that office, and I'm not sure that resonated. Um, past his tenure, we'll have a new assistant secretary in yeah. a year or so, I suppose. Um, where, again, I think NGOs, tribal governments in the Northwest are a, a major component of both sides of the border negotiations that have not been. Uh, uh, the whole environmental side of the management of the river is not included in the original treaty. So I think all that still is in. Play, and I think we're going to have to do something as far as going to Congress with this shot, but uh, it's from that point forward that a minute system um, would allow more adaptive nature to the, the ultimately adopt um, treaty than, than what we've got now. Yeah, and, and I do think that you mentioned the other parallel, which is the Columbia River Treaty was originally designed for just hydropower and flood control. That was all they were thinking about. It didn't have an environmental component, but like Minute 319, there are a number of parties, including both the U.S. tribes and the Canadian First Nations, that want to bring that environmental component into the treaty. That was successfully done with Minute 319, and hopefully we'll continue with Minute 32X. Um, and that's part of what uh, part of the U.S.'s position in the renegotiation of the Columbia River Treaty, not clear how that's all going to turn out. But I, I think there are definite parallels. Yes, back here. So I'm not, um, not a lawyer. I come more from the science background. I'm a hydrologist. And, and one of the things that we see in Montana with the legislature is really matching the science with the policy. And so I sit here and I watch this through you know, a scientific lens. And with these big agreements, and I grew up in Arizona, so I'm very familiar with, with the issues with Colorado. Um, with these big agreements, when you're splitting up the upper Columbia Basin and the lower and distributing water, it'd be great if we could make water occur in the same amounts, in the same, you know, whatever, uh, in the same volumes, in the same regions all the time. How are they dealing with climate effect? If we get a little uh, El Nino this or La Nina this year, and we have higher amounts, that makes sense to be able to send it downstream, but when you have a reversal of that, how are those types of things, the science of water, where it's actually occurring, how it's distributed, how are those being dealt with in some of the negotiations or the agreements? 
Um, a, a couple of different ways, and, and some not at all. Um, so the Colorado River system has a ton of storage. Um, it has 60 million acre feet of storage. The annual flow is, let's say, around 15 million acre feet. So it's got four times the storage than the annual flow. That makes this system able to adapt um, to both low hydrology and high hydrology. Um, and that was the whole idea. Lake Powell was created in order to provide a buffer for the upper basin states. In case the flows were low, they would have water in storage um, that they could release to meet their obligations. So I think storage is the major factor that people are counting on to address volatility in hydrology. But as we've seen, if, if you're withdrawing more money from your bank account every year than you put in, uh, eventually you're going to get to the bottom. Um, and that's what we're seeing happening now. So all of these efforts are designed to try to restore the system to a, a safer level. So that's one answer. The other, I think part of the problem that, that is not being addressed, at least in its entirety, is the very, very dire climate change predictions for the southwestern part of the country. Um, and I increasingly, the, the scientists are finding that we, we can predict with some degree of certainty temperature increases. We have less certainty around what that does to precipitation, but, but the correlation is developing much stronger between um, temperature increases and runoff decreases. And runoff, not precipitation, is what fills the reservoir. In some of the bleaker climate change scenarios, we don't have an answer. You know, if, if flows decrease by 50 or 60 or 70 percent, which is what's projected in, um, in some of the climate change scenarios, none of this is going to be enough. Um, and some would argue that at that point, the compact has to be renegotiated because the upper basin states would lose everything. Um, and that's, that's not an acceptable answer um, in, in, you know, our politics. Um, so some, some science uh, is certainly uh, being incorporated. And we're trying to learn more. The federal agencies are, are working hard on trying to learn more and get more predictive. But there's some science that we're not dealing with. So there's another question. Yeah. Ms. Gessel, uh, your presentation's been illuminating on that. Great issues. I was curious if you mentioned uh, weather modification. I know Montana and Colorado, there's been legal frameworks developed for that. I'm curious, does or will the private sector play a role in administering those programs? Um, good question. Uh, the, the cloud seeding programs that I'm familiar with are state run. Um, and in fact, the one in the Colorado River Basin takes place mostly in Wyoming. They're seeding partly in Colorado. So Wyoming and Colorado, it's paid for by all seven basin states and the Bureau of Reclamation, um, but it's state run. They have done um, some scientific studies about whether it works, um, and, and those are done with private consulting <coughs> firms. Um, and just in case you're wondering, the, the results are mixed. Um, the, the studies, the uh, State of Wyoming commissioned a very extensive 10-year study. It's hard to find a control, right, if you're seeding, you know, so you have to find a comparable basin. There were some flaws in the study protocol that kind of had to start over. The, the study concluded that there was a 10% increase in precipitation as a result of cloud seeding. Um, that result or that conclusion is questioned um, by some atmospheric scientists. Uh, but it's cheap, um, so if, if you're really producing 10% more precipitation and you look at the amount of money that you pay to see the clouds, it's like 10 or 5% of the amount that you pay to, um, to make a farmer fallow his field. And so I think the overall um, thinking is, we don't know if it works, but if it works, it's cheap. Um, and so we'll, we'll just continue to do it for a while. But um, I haven't, I mean, there are private contractors that actually, you know, fly the planes and see the clouds, but it's all coming from state money. Do you have a question? 
Uh, yeah, um, you mentioned the issue with um, uh, uh, Wyoming trying to be more efficient and not affecting Montana um, up along the Yellowstone. Um, I was wondering if you had any ideas about how Montana and, and, and other states here could, um, could like anticipate shortages and conservation more and be more proactive uh, about our water supply. Yeah. Um, well, there, there are other people in this room who may be able to answer that question better than I. But, um, but you know, what's happening in the Colorado River Basin, if you take that as instructive, is um, there's high value farming. There's high value farming in the Imperial Valley and in the Mexicali Valley. There's low value farming um, that, that may be important to rural economies, but just looked at on a um, per acre foot basis, like economic productivity in the crop per acre foot is very much lower value. So if, if a state is concerned about maintaining its high level economic productivity, it could generate revenue somehow, maybe from the higher productive farmers, and pay to follow the lower productivity. And that could go across state. Um, but you, you'd have to work out a, and, and there's lots of politics around that, yeah. you know? Um, so you'd have to work out an agreement um, that addressed not just the water quantity issues, but the, the whole basket of economic impacts in both states, I would think. Yeah, we're here. Um, a couple of quick questions. Did California finally get down to living within their uh, allocation? Yes. Um, and then uh, Wyoming with its 14% allocation and nothing going on there, and Wyoming's very protective. They don't want the water to go out if they're not using it. Is there any movement uh, in negotiations um, with Wyoming being open to giving some of the away or some yeah. of the You know, that's an interesting question. Um, so because the upper basin allocations are percentages, um, and, and you're correct, Wyoming is not using even its 14% allocation. Um, New Mexico is using all of its. Uh, Colorado is kind of close. Utah would get there if they develop some of the projects they have on the books. Wyoming's not there. I have not heard any discussion about revisiting those percentage allocations. Um, on the other hand, uh, when we're talking about the creation of system water and demand management in the upper basin, Wyoming is a prime target because, going back to the previous question, there's a fair amount of low value irrigation happening in um, Wyoming and in western Colorado. And so those are the targets if you're trying to get bang for the buck of federal money or state money or municipal supplier money, that's where you go, is hay, grass, and hay farmers not to irrigate. Yeah, I'm going to oh, go maybe step in just in the interest of time. Um, we have a reception set up outside. And we want to make sure uh, that you all get to enjoy that reception um, before they take it down. And there's opportunity there to keep asking questions to Dan. I really appreciate all of you coming and thank you so much for spending time with us. Absolutely.